All right. So this morning, for um, those of you who have been here the last couple of weeks, you'd be aware that Al has embarked um, on a journey with us in unpacking this whole topic of faith. And last week, he spoke about having faith in the character and nature of God, and he shared his testimony of uh, as a single man when he lived in Central Asia. <clears throat> And so this week, I kind of wanted to bounce off that because if you're anything like me, I just like to know practically what does that mean? Like, give me the bottom line of what does that look like in my life and how do I know if it's there? And so I found myself this week pondering over that, having faith in the character and nature of God. And so I want to pose the question this morning, and this is what I want to unpack with us, is what does it look like practically hands and feet in our world if we have faith in the character of nature of God. When I opened up the scriptures this week and started to look at that, I was amazed at how uh, God spoke right from the beginning, all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, right through to Revelation. And he had this theme essentially where he is communicating to his people, that's you and I, that Jesus is the same back in the book of Genesis, right up to the New Testament and right to the very end. And he will always be the same. And so having faith in the character and nature of God is not having faith in what he does for his people, the works, the miracles, the the tangible things, but it's the person of God, who he is. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. Say that with me, Jesus. Is there only two? Jesus is the same yesterday, the same today, right now, and he will be forever. Psalm 102 verse 27 says, But you are the same, and your years will have no end, speaking of God. Malachi 3 verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Isn't that amazing? Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Revelation 1 verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. And I know for some of us, when we read the scripture and we read how God was doing things in the Old Testament, it's kind of a little bit kind of funky to unpack that, that he's the same yesterday, today and forever. When you think of some of the things that he used to do, that was pretty hardcore. But we're not talking about the works of God. We're talking about the person of God, the personality of God. It's not referring to what Jesus does, but who he is. God is good. Amen. God is trustworthy. God is righteous. God is faithful. And God is unchanging. I, um, I want to share a story with you this morning that for some of you, you would have heard Alan and I share on and off bits and pieces, but uh, I want to share in detail from my perspective. So Alan and I worked, walked this same journey through, but this is seeing it through my lens. Is that okay? Nothing I think in my entire Christian experience, I gave my heart to Christ at the age of 20, Um, after having attempted to live life my own way and made a mess of it, and said to the Lord at 20 years of age, uh, if you can do anything with this, then I'm yours. And so he magnificently entered my world in grace and forgiveness and began to put me on a journey of healing and restoration. And that saw me move to uh, Brisbane, where I met my husband and... um, awesome man. And um, we, Alan had a passion and he shared with you before um, for the nation of India and for the people of India. And so one of the first things that Alan said to me, as every romantic man does, if you don't feel that you could settle in uh, India, um, then we can't be. And so I thought, well, I best go and explore. And so off I went on a short-term outreach. We had joined with an organisation, Youth with a Mission, and we've talked a little bit about that, and one of our beautiful families has their boy there now. And um, I went on a short-term mission trip to India. And, you know, somebody once said that the nation of India is an assault on every one of your five senses. And I thought, amen, 
Amen. You see, you have to understand, I had stepped straight out of the hairdressing salon. I was a hairdresser by trade. So, you know, I kind of had a way of doing things. And so when I hit this third world nation, oh, I mean, I've got to tell you, I just thought, Al, nobody is worth this. So I spent a few weeks there and God did such a beautiful work in my heart, you know, and not about the country because it's filthy, but you know what, the people, the people in that country are the most beautiful, beautiful humans. And I often say, apart from Australia, it's the second best country in the world and I genuinely mean that. We went on to get married and we had a son, Caleb, and um, Al, we were living in Bundaberg in Queensland, and Al and I just started to feel like, you know what, it's, it's kind of, we need to go back. We could sense the call of God. And um, that meant that we had to have a conversation with each other and with our families. Both of us come from unchurched backgrounds, so not, none of our family was saved, apart from my incredible praying mother. And the, the conversation kind of went along the lines of, we have a son, we wanted more children, what would that look like? Because the plan was that we would relocate to India without coming, the thought of coming back. We were to sell everything and blah, blah, blah. And when we were talking, Alan and I, and praying about that, I felt like God spoke this word to me, not audibly, not, you know, nobody appeared weird and creepy, but I just had this sense that God was saying to me that, Jackie, your mission is to do all that you can to minimise the distance between you in the West and them in the East. And how I perceived that, I guess, for me personally was, as a woman, moving to a country where uh, women live very differently, what could I do to minimise the distance? That, that I'm already white and Western, which puts distance between us. So what, how can I minimise that? And so I went to Al, and when we talked about expanding our family, I said to him, I feel like um, a, we want more children, but that we are to have them there and that we need to close the door to the concept of coming home. Well, we sat down with our families uh, in preparation to leave, and we shared this with them. And my father, um, the way I describe my family is I come from an alpha male family. Do people understand that, if I say that? He was a strong man and generally got what he wanted. And so, and I'm an only daughter, right, baby of the family. So for him, that's not happening. When you uh, fall pregnant again, you will come home, that's full stop. And so, uh, but the interesting thing was my father had a very soft heart towards my husband and that in itself is a miracle, but he trusted Alan. And so Alan began to speak to him about how we felt called to India and, and what we felt like God had said. And while my ha dad had no point of reference or understanding, he just let it lie. So off we went, 22-year-old <laughs> kids really um, with our little boy in tow and it wasn't long after we arrived maybe I don't know 10 months 12 months or something and um, we had the exciting news that we were pregnant and so we do what everybody does is we phoned home phoned our friends because we were part of a, a youth with a mission which is an international uh, organization we had friends from all over the world that we'd encountered during our time so we shared the news wide and broad and were excited and our families were excited um, our, our um, Christian family was equally as excited except for my dad and so he rose the issue again of I would like you to come home and so you know we just continued to um, back in the day of faxes can you remember faxes when that was technology there was no uh, Facebook or Instagram or any of that that's how we communicated and he just continued to kind of plant those seeds that I'd really like you to go come home and I've pa I'll pay for the ticket and yada yada and so we progressed on this awesome journey of having our second child and um, you know nothing's normal in India in terms of having a baby they cipher blood orally well who knew still back then so it was you know it was a totally different experience but feeling confident that God had spoken to me to minimize the distance between you in the west and them in the east and so I would go along, we had found this awesome doctor that um, other people who had been in youth mission who had had babies over there had introduced us to and she was a wonderful woman who trained in the UK, Hindu lady, and she was fantastic. I would meet with her weekly and she would do, you know, all those tests and everything was uh, going along swimmingly. 
And at 20 weeks, as most of you have had babies know, off you head to uh, have a sonogram. And we were in there. And in India, um, instead of going off to just the radiography, your GP comes with you, her nurse comes with you, and they kind of did it in the same facility. And so we are in there all very excited. And yes, there was only one heartbeat, and that was wonderful. And I guess the general vibe in the room was quite exciting. And Alan and I were so excited, you know, that first time that you see the little person and you see the heartbeat and, you know, it, it just, it, there's nothing quite like it, the miracle of creation in a, in a, in a person. And um, all of a sudden we noticed that our doctor, our, so our GP, stopped speaking in English and she began to communicate to the radiographer in Hindi. And not that that was necessarily unusual, but the tone was unusual. And we'd been there long enough, we'd learned a bit of the language. And so you just felt like the vibe in the room had changed. And my GP sent the nurse out for, for a time and she came back with two more doctors. And, you know, as um, I'm sure a lot of you have been in this situation, my tummy just started to churn that something was wrong. They continued on with the um, sonogram and the three specialists were bitter, bitter, bitter in Hindi and the radiographers doing what they were saying. And then everything packed up, wiped down and, and at the end of that consult you go back into where my GP was and she sat us down and she said, look, unfortunately, and no, nobody wants to hear unfortunately, you just know that whatever's coming is not good. Unfortunately, the um, sonogram has picked up that your baby has fluid on the brain. And while, you know, not that that was common, but that she, she had said to us, um, I need to point out what that might mean for you. And so she gave us the pros and the cons. And if I can be brutally honest with you, I heard nothing of what she said. All I heard her say was, my baby had fluid on the brain. And then I just felt like the room went silent. My head was screaming with all these other voices. Alan and I left that appointment and um, got on the bike, the motorbike, and we rode home in complete silence. And, you know, we got home and we sat there, um, I, look, I would say for a good 10 minutes before we could even speak to one another. And um, when we did speak, oh, look, I'd love to say to you that we were just going, well, praise the Lord. Let's position ourselves for a miracle. But it just didn't go like that. I just felt anxious. I felt stressed. I felt like fear was speaking decibels above anybody else's voice that was speaking to me. Here we were in this funky place and family so far away and we were so young and just thinking... Dear God, what have we done? Well, look, this proceeded on for about 13 weeks. She put us on a plan that every week we would go in and have an ultrasound and she would uh, check the progress of our baby. And, you know, in India they terminate uh, babies right up to 40 weeks. And so for her it was just a foregone that we'll, I guess because we're white and Western, we will, we'll, we'll patronise you by continuing to do this. But their way is to terminate. And look, as the weeks progressed, and we were praying, and we put a call out to the people that we were working with, would you pray with us? I've got my dad in the, in the background, come home, come home, come home, safety of Western medicine, come home, I want you home. And each week we went into that uh, doctor's surgery, it just got worse. His uh, spine had not formed, his heart had not formed, the lungs were not developing, the kidneys were stuffed. It just seemed like every week we were getting further and further away from God answering our prayer. Anyway, um, we got to, I was 33 weeks pregnant. We went into um, the GP and she gave a, um, another sonogram and her advice to us when we sat back in her office you know, we need to seriously look at termination. The re reality is this, Jacqueline. She called me Jacqueline. She said, you will either have a baby stillborn or your baby will be born with deformities and will not live. But either way, unfortunately, you won't go home with a baby. Well, 
you know, we were desperate people. And again, I would love to say that we rode the wave of faith and we were the missionaries in the developing country, you know, saving souls. But I've got to tell you, we were stressed. I have never in my life felt levels of anxiety like I did in that period of time. And so we asked her one more week. You see, termination was not an uh, option for us. But here's the reality. Uh, we lived in a country where we didn't speak their language. And my fear was, I'd said to Elle, if I go into that place, will I know what they're doing? Will, will I know that that's what they're doing when they don't all speak my language? And so we asked her, I'll come back in a week. But we're trusting our God. And, you know, she was a Hindu, bless, and she kind of bit a bitter and, you know, thought we were crazy and moved on. Well, you know what? We went home and I will never forget, we sat on the end of our bed and we just bawled like babies, absolutely bawled like babies. And when we pulled ourselves together, we knelt down and we just simply pray, God, if you don't intervene here, it's hopeless. There is nothing that we can do. We're calling on you for a miracle. You know, we got back up. We, we felt exactly the same as we did when we were sobbing white babies. Went on with the week and you know, just feeling sick. Went off to the um, next sonogram and uh, she was in there with us. She again sent the nurse out. And she, the she, nurse came back in with the same two doctors that had originally uh, given us our news. And, you know, they're bitter, bitter, bitter again. She'd stopped speaking English and gone on to speak Hindi and they were doing their thing. Tidied everything up, went back into her office and she just sat there. And this time she was not speaking. <laughs> and we thought, <laughs> here we go. And she said, I don't know what to say to you people. But all I know is last week, your baby's situation was hopeless. And today, we find no fluid. Hearts functioning normally. Lungs are healed. Kidneys, spine. That little baby was pumping like a 33-week-old normal baby. Well, I mean, I've got to tell you, I lost the plot. I didn't even know what happened after that. But all I know is, but God, you did something that we could not do. I want to share three things that I learned out of that experience while we're on this whole topic of faith. What does faith in the character and nature of God look like? <clears throat> faith in the character and nature of God, number one, leads to obedience. I don't know about you if you've had those situations where you, you are in a moment or in a space where everything is screaming at you, this is ridiculous. My father, who I, I had a great relationship with him, he was an interesting man and a very strong man, but I just, no, you know, there's nobody like your father as a daughter. And so when he spoke, you know, I wanted to do and the right thing and to please him. And so when he wanted me home, I've got to be honest, I thought, I want to go home because that's, that's my dad's talking, right? But you know what? At the same time, my heavenly dad is talking, saying, minimise the distance between you in the West and them in the East. How many of you know that sometimes when God calls on you to be obedient, it seems ridiculous, it's uncomfortable, there's uncertainty, it can even look foolish and irrational to those around you, and in some cases, it can actually look unwise and dangerous. And that was my dad's perspective. He thought we were completely foolish. And there are a couple of occasions, I've got to be honest, he ripped out a new one for encouraging me to do what I felt to do. And so sometimes faith looks like irrational decisions are made, stupid decisions are made, and you just got to hope that God's going to come through. Faith in the character and the nature of God leads to obedience. The second thing that faith in the character and nature of God does is it leads to rejoicing for others. You know, when we um, had Johnny, who <laughs> we, we went on to have a little boy, Johnny, or Jonathan David, gift of the Lord, and I will, who I might say turns 23 in two weeks. That boy should have been dead, and God knows he's given me more grey hair than I care to think about, but let me tell you, he had to be tenacious from the time he was in the womb, and so I praise God for him. And every time 
of year around March 8th, I've got to tell you, I, I just get messy. I'm just emotional, you know, because I'm reminded of the goodness of God. Anyway, when we had Johnny, and because people had heard of our story within the organisation that we worked with, we had wonderful communication from Australia, from Europe, from the US, people that had been friends who had bought into our miracle. And we'd had phone calls and uh, fax messages, emails, and one of which, even to this day, stands out above all the others, above family, cards, the whole thing. There was a beautiful couple that we were friends with, Tim and Claire. I won't share their surname for obvious reasons, but Tim and Claire. And um, I had met them when I'd first become a Christian, and so that had a significant role in my early Christian experience, and I loved these guys. Tim was this rugged Oka Aussie farmer, and um, they had just really, I guess, loved on me in such a really beautiful way in my early days of faith. They phoned us phoned us from Australia, they'd left youth with a mission and um, gone back to be on the land in central Queensland. And we got this call from Tim and Claire and as soon as I heard their voice, I just felt tears come. Al was there and we were um, speaking to them and they said, you know, we, we wanted to call and congratulate you on the incredible news of Johnny and we wanted to pray a blessing over you and your baby. And, you know, that's kind of normal stuff, isn't it, around Christians? That's beautiful. But the thing that made it so uniquely phenomenal about this couple is that 18 months earlier, they'd sat in a doctor's surgery and been delivered the same news that we had. Unfortunately, your baby has fluid on the brain. And they were in a comfortable Western hospital in, in, in Queensland. And so circumstances were different, but same, same. And you know what? Their story didn't end like mine. Their little guy, little boy as well, continued to uh, worsen in his condition and uh, Claire gave birth to a little boy uh, who was stillborn. And so their, their, I guess their result, if you like, the story ended very differently. And you know, I have never forgotten that call because the faith in the nature and character of God in not the works that he does, but in who he is. That's the only way you can contact somebody when you haven't got the outcome you'd so desperately prayed for and they had. And that you can open yourself and say, I want to pray blessing, I celebrate and I delight for you. Let me pray over you and that little boy. I tell you what, faith in the nature and character of God leads to rejoicing when others get what you didn't. The third thing that faith in the character and nature of God is it frees you up to be honest and transparent before God. You know, um, Alan and I probably have a slightly different experience in while we walked the same road as a couple. For me, as the mother carrying the baby, um, I would, you know, I'd love to say, as I said in the beginning, that I was so full of faith. But you know what? Every time, every time Johnny kicked on the inside, I felt anxious and was acutely aware that without you, God, doing something, this is hopeless. When Alan and I came home after the second last scan and it just seemed to be a disaster, you know, we were not, I was definitely not, I just was shattered. And yet it opened up this whole new realm of sharing honestly before God how I really felt. You know, not all the Christian jargon that we say to one another when we're here on a Sunday and everything's fine, but you know that real place when it's just you and him. Faith in the nature and character of God, it frees you up to be honest before your heavenly father. You know, Johnny's, uh, Johnny's story, as I call it, is now a testimony that we have and will have forever. And, you know, no doctor, and, and no disrespect to anyone in the medical profession, but no doctor, no devil from hell, no anybody will ever strip that from us. When I look at that boy, I just am reminded of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. That it doesn't matter what he did yesterday, doesn't matter what he'll do tomorrow, his character and his nature and the person of God is good. 
I cannot tell you in my Christian experience how many times I've drawn on that testimony when God has called us to a place of faith and everything in the natural seems to be screaming out the opposite. But I feel like God has given me that testimony that in those moments, but God, I know it looks like this, but God, I know it sounds like this and it's enormous, but God... Amen. How many of you have testimonies like that where you call on in those hard times or when you're just feeling like your spiritual vision becomes foggy? I wondered this morning, and I'll, I will close with this, I want to give us a, an assignment. All the teachers went, amen. This is, um, this is the assignment. At Christmas time, uh, Chloe, Ellen and I had this tub. And, you know, if it's your thing, don't judge me. But we had this tub of photos of our wedding and this beautiful album that we'd been gifted, you know, as part of the package and blah, blah. And, you know, we just thrown them in, to be honest. We've moved around quite a bit and it's probably not my thing, you know, doing pretty albums and all of that. And so we just sort of had them thrown in this box. And our beautiful daughter without us knowing, had gathered all of those photos and had bought this really pretty album and she had put together for us um, a wedding, a, a wedding story, I guess. And, you know, Alan and I were so touched by it. While we just had never gotten around to it, to be able to go from start to finish and relive the moment and remember the fun and the laughter and the joy that was around that time was so awesome. And I've put that little album out now on display because it's a reminder of just what a great, great man that I have. Well, the same it is in my Christian experience. This is what I call my faith file. And I've got quite a few of these. This one's so had it. It's got no zip left and it's busted and all of that. But here's what I do. <clears throat> when God, or in life when I've had situations and circumstances come up, I go to my faith file. And I pull out this stuff. And this is just one of many, but because it's the story I shared today, I thought I'd bring it so you could get a visual. And in this particular faith file, I have uh, Johnny's birth certificate, Johnny's citizenship papers. I have Johnny's final um, imaging of where she could no longer find fluid on his brain and on his body. And I have every um, appointment and bits and bobs that I'd picked up along the way um, from that experience. And so when God calls on me to do or to believe him for something that's a little bit ridiculous, I pull that out. And every time I look at it, it's, oh, sorry, it's a reminder of the goodness of God, of the nature and the faithfulness of God. I wonder how many of you have faith files stored up here that at times when the pressure's on and you're under the pump and your spiritual vision becomes foggy, it's hard to remember or it's hard to recall. And so it's good in those moments to have something tangible, something you can lay your hands on and, and look at and provoke and stir faith. You know, I'll bet out of this group of people and for those of you who are online, there would be people this morning that God is asking you to step into faith. Maybe you've got things going on in your own health, your family, your loved ones. I mean, we've only got to look around our community to see that God's calling us to a place of faith. But I want to personalise it. And I believe that there would be people here this morning and, you, and God is asking you to step into faith. And it's hard and every other voice is screaming out for your attention this morning. Then I bet there's others and you have stories and testimonies and situations even up till yesterday where God's come through for you. And you know the sad thing is often in, in Christian community we get together and we talk about everything else but the things that God has done and is doing in our lives. And I wonder if this morning, so, part, so the homework has two parts. I wonder this morning if you would over coffee or just chatting here, whatever, if you would begin to talk about the goodness of God in your life, what has God done for you where you feel it could stir and provoke faith in others? Of not of his works, 
but of his character and the person of God. And then I wonder if you would go home and whether you would be able to start your own faith file. For me, that's a visual reminder. And I, wanna, I guess I want to just preface by saying, does that mean that God heals all the time? No, it doesn't. You know, for those of you who have been with us in this community for quite a while, you would remember Michelle that we prayed and believed God for for so long to um, be healed of breast cancer. And it became very obvious that God's ultimate healing was for her soul and he encountered her life in a very real and, and tangible way and she went home to be with the Lord. So does that mean that every time um, healing is needed or asked for, d- does that mean that when I pray for people they, they are healed? No, I've seen plenty go home and be with the Lord. But what it does do is I have faith that whatever God chooses to do, I'm going to stand with you until the very end because I do believe that God is a healing God. And the reason I believe it is because I have a story, I have a testimony, and I have a beautiful boy who turns 23 in 14 days who stands healed and whole because God chose in his grace and mercy to touch his body and make it well. So I want to encourage you this morning... Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As we share our stories and our testimonies, it, faith begins to build. Don't keep them up locked up inside of you. It doesn't matter how big or small. It doesn't matter how intense or not intense. It's a story and God can use it. God can write on the back and impart faith. What does faith in the nature and character of God look like? It looks like it leads to obedience. It leads to rejoicing with others no matter what. And it leads to honesty and transparency before your God. Let me pray. Father, I thank you this morning, uh, Lord, that just that reminder, Father, that without faith, Father, without faith, it's impossible to please you. And God, we so desire in the midst of our humanness and our just at the stuff of life, God, we so desire to be a community. Father, that of faith, that God would dare to believe you at your word, would dare to trust that you are the same yesterday, today and forever. Father, that we would be a community, God, who knows the nature and the character of God. Father, whose faith doesn't rest upon what you do, but it rests upon, God, who you are, that you are a good God, that you are a faithful God, that you are a just God, And that, Lord, you are righteous in all of your ways. Father, I pray for every person in this room and those who are listening online. God, those that you are calling to a place of faith. Father, those that have stuff going on. Those, God, that are aware that when they walk out of that door, the stuff of life is there to confront them. Father, I pray that you would meet them this morning, God. Lord, that you would give them a sense of hope. Father, that you would give them a sense of hope that you are good in all your ways, that you are working even when we can't see it. Father, even when we don't feel like you are, even when the report goes from bad to worse, Father, you are at work. And we can trust in your nature and your character. God, you are the same yesterday, today and forever. And Father, for those of us who have had situations and circumstances where you have been so incredibly faithful, God, I pray that you would give each of us the courage to share our stories, to throw caution to the wind, God, and just put it out there. And Father, trust that you, God, will use our story to bring glory to you. Father, I commit every single person in this room to you, in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.